What initially made me want to join the Army? Just patriotism. I grew up in a, in a patriotic family uh, that really loved our country. Sort of a military family. Uh, my father was career military. My brother, special forces, a team leader. Those two men always inspired me to, to want to be a soldier. My father was stationed in Korea in uh, 1989. That was the first time that I saw an attack helicopter. And I remember looking up at my dad and telling him, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I was always interested in joining. And then um, when I was uh, probably a sophomore in high school, I read a book called The Long Gray Line about the West Point class in 1966. And it got me hooked. I visited. I'm now from a small town in South Georgia. So going to West Point, it was just, it was a pretty incredible experience. I went to Ground Zero. Every building in every direction was obliterated, shrapnel, blankets still hanging in the windows. But right across the street, and those streets are really small, right across the street, there's a church. This church was perfect, and it looked like it was as old as New York itself. Rod iron fence around it. So people were using this wrought iron fence that went around this thing to post notes. I'm looking for so-and-so. It's still a big mess. They're still looking for people. I'm out, have you found this person? We're looking for this. And so I start reading these. And uh, I get to one, and it's a uh, it's a little girl, she's blonde hair, blue eyes, she's sitting on daddy's lap, daddy's a firefighter. And there's a little picture there and this is written in crayon. And it's, daddy, please come home, I'll, I'll, I'll eat my vegetables, I'll, I'll do my homework, I'll clean my room. Please come home, daddy, I'll give you a mission. I'm, I'm a grown man, I lose it. And I'm bawling and there's hundreds of these. And right then um, was a turning point in my life. Uh, sun was coming up, I got in a cab, went to the airport. Um, Got off the plane in Houston, Texas. I lived in, in River Oaks. And I walked into the Army recruiter's office. Said I'd like to volunteer. Combat training center rotations like NTC or JRTC, it allows crew members to make mistakes, learn from their mistakes. They put air crews in situations that are real, and especially guys who are right out of flight school have never done it before, it, it enables them to get closer to where they need to be. It still doesn't get them to the point where they're like at 100%. They're not designed for aviation. They're designed for a ground maneuver brigade to come there and get ready, not for the aviators. So we're support, we're helping them train. Now I get training out of it, it's not for us, specifically. It was a good introduction into Apache operations, but what we went and did and experienced in Iraq, nah. It didn't prepare us for that. I prefer JRTC for a train up for Iraq because it more closely replicates the urban terrain in, in Baghdad for what it's worth. It, you know, the NTC really just didn't meet the mail for that. What I do remember about is we learned some hard lessons. The one story that comes to mind is uh, when Cole Mohan shot a surface to air missile van. And it probably was the surface-to-air missile van, but because there was a little bit of doubt in his voice when he transmitted uh, the battle damage assessment, uh, I think they used that as a teachable moment. If flight school was a fire hose, that thing was Niagara Falls because every day you're doing something I hadn't done before, trying to figure a new situation out. And it kind of culminated with, with a bad decision where uh, Troy Mosley and I decided to shoot somebody that, that now, keep in mind, this is at JRTC, so nobody actually dies, but we, we shot what was a role player's wife that was also the mayor, and we got in some trouble for that. And I just remember thinking, man, if, if the next six years are like this, because my, my IRW commitment, then uh, I don't know how this is going to work. This is, this is not going to be enjoyable at all. The actors did a really good job of replicating a very upset family. 
maybe not the most realistic scenario, but it brought to light that, hey, you know, you, your, uh, your actions, you know, these, these two fingers can, can change lives for the better or for the worse in, in a matter of seconds. I think there's some goodness to JRTC. Um, the difficulty I had with it is just the terrain itself. It's a wooded environment, you know, it's Louisiana. And it doesn't really lend itself to what we were doing over Baghdad and over the deserts of Iraq. Um, as much as people hate NTC, that place is obviously much more well suited. But what it did do, I think, is is it gave a lot of the first timers, a lot of the younger guys who hadn't been there yet, you know, hadn't really been exposed to uh, how hard it is to track a moving vehicle that's trying to rapidly exit the area. It gave those guys an opportunity to really kind of develop some skills that I don't think they would have had without that rotation, to be honest with you. We gripe about it, and we don't like being inconvenienced back at home. But at the end of the day, you can't ever train too hard for a job that can kill you. You know, the Apache is an incredibly complicated machine if you don't use it a lot. And once you use it a lot, it becomes an extension of your body, and that's what you're looking for. And you got to be able to anticipate what you're going to do, you know, how you're going to position the aircraft, what weapon you're going to use. You have to crew coordinate, cover your wingman, or lead your wingman, make those radio calls. That division of labor can't be one of those things you have to direct all the time to be efficient. And you only get that, that efficiency in training. Units across the Army, especially aviation, have to take their training seriously. Um, if you're flying around just a joyride, you're wasting blade time, you're wasting hours. There, there should be a tactical task and purpose into what you're doing um, because you never know when something's going to go sideways. And the training is really all you have. remember as we were approaching Taji, you could see the lights outside the back of the ramp of the Chinook, and it was a little dusty, you know, that dusty glow haze of the lights that you learn to love there in Iraq at night. And we're setting up for an approach, and the pilot makes this hard maneuver, and the CMOS goes off, so the decoy flares fly off the aircraft. And immediately, the ramp gunner swings his machine gun over and starts firing. And I'm like, well, this is great. I'm going to get to Iraq to be a gun pilot, and I'm going to get shot down in the back of a Chinook. Well, that's a hell of a way to go. So it turned out they were just test firing and, and hamming it up, but uh, that was an interesting experience, my first couple of seconds there flying into Taji. The smell was the first thing I remember, because the burn pit is north, and the wind was prevailing from north to south that constant smell of burning trash, plastic, and other things, and it just, like, man, that, that is awful. You know, one of the things we do when we get into theater, a lot of different people have different means of coping with the time away, and routine is probably the most important thing to keep in your mind clear, you know, doing your mission, and having a routine when you're not out on mission kind of helps the days pass a little quicker. We were running 24-hour ops. We had four aircraft up at a time, two from each battalion on either side of the river. So it was long hours. As a commission guy, as a battle captain, we were flying one day and then working in the battle captain position the next. And it stacked off and on, so it was busy. We lived in Chews, which were containerized housing units. Basically all it is is a compartmentalized trailer. There were barriers put around each chew, and there were mortar bunkers in each area that you could run to if there was an attack. The only problem with that is you run the risk of, during an attack, running from your trailer to the bunker and something happened in between there. So you had to make a risk analysis and decide, am I just going to stay under here under my bed, or am I going to run, take a chance and run to the bunker? After living at a cop, coming back to Taji was like kind of going on a vacation, only because you had hot showers, a real toilet, I had a chew, I got to spend two nights in it every 10 days. We spent 10 days out at the cop, 
we come back for two days and those two days you know you're soaking up every minute of it you know the you know you're waiting in line at the kbr defect for the stir fry you don't care how long it takes you're you're getting a real hot meal before you go back to canned food and mres it was strange to see how routine it was it, we were already used to this this was our life back in fort hood go work on the aircraft all day and go home we didn't realize we were being trained for this every day and it was just normal to us but then the mortars fall and the rockets and that shakes things up a little bit i remember when we we transitioned from balad down to taji and we were walking through the trailers and like where our company was at there was a trailer missing and the 4id folks had said oh yeah that one got hit by a rocket <laughs> and it, it really kind of put things in perspective everything was dress right dress the roads were being swept the trash was being picked up you're you know you had mps given traffic tickets to people speeding and it was very orderly and neat uh, but when you went outside that gate there was a lot of sectarian violence going on at the time it maybe took five or six minutes outside the pattern at taji to see tracers so a lot of times you could spend the entire night three four five hours bouncing from what we call ticks troops in contact from one to another across Baghdad and, and never actually get to the, the prescribed mission that, that you thought you were going to do because you're, you know, going 911 to four or five different places. So it was a weird duality. You know, it was very peaceful on, on the camp. I don't remember as much indirect fire, at least initially when we got there, as we got in OIF-2, um, but that changed. Flew with Cornell a lot. We flew basically every day. So it was Cornell Chow and myself, Matt Rowe, and Chip Diston. Well, we were flying so many hours during this time that they were beginning to restrict us. So Matt Rowe and Chip Diston were off that day. They were replaced by Johnny Judd and Mark Roche. Corn wanted me in Johnny's front seat to fly flight lead, and then he was going to be in the trail ship as AMC with Mark in the front seat. We were just on a normal patrol. So safe guys out fishing for business and making noise, trying to keep the good guys on the ground safe. We were southwest side of Baghdad, um, pretty far down there. We got the call. They said, hey, we need you guys to go to Kalsu and get as many hellfires as you can, and we're going to brief you when you get down there. Core and I didn't even have to speak. We knew immediately that we could get down there and load hellfires, and then the job is another 100 miles. Well, I was the only armament person there during that time, and then there were two crew chiefs. I had a sticky note from the talk where they, they brought me in and let me know that Big Gun 7-2 and 7-3 were coming in and they needed heavy Hellfire missiles. We didn't quite have enough Hellfires to fill them up. The note had said to make sure that I put everything we had on there, and that was their last stop on the way out. We called immediately, hey, we're Redcon 1. We're ready to depart. Where do you need us? And there was a long pause because we knew that they weren't expecting us to be that quick. So we got the mission. And we called down to the Titan element was the call sign we were given, Air Force JTACs. And as we're calling in, we're 25 minutes out, and that's the last I heard from him. I could hear gunfire in the background on the radio. The next time I heard from him, 
we were over the top and we had become the targets. They said, there's a large volume of fire that is following your aircraft. Uh, we are coming your way, but we can't shoot anything until we know where they are. And we ended up locating them with a signal mirror of all things. So we find the biggest weapon system that we can find that's firing in their direction and request permission to fire and we're setting up and we're gonna shoot at it. All right, I got a white bongo and a blue bongo. Looks like, uh, yeah, roll in on him. Wasn rockets. Now the good guys see, you know, where we're about to, to shoot and they look and they see the Iraqi Humvees and vehicles. From their perspective, it looked like we may be shooting at the Iraqi Humvees. None of us knew that all of those guys were deceased. So they called ceasefire, ceasefire. Oh, no, 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 do not, do not, do not. They said ceasefire. They said ceasefire. Do not, do not. We just went switches cold, um, and then we are, are about to pull up and turn out. When that happens now, the, the blades make a lot of noise. And everybody that's down there that was shooting surface to surface is now looked up and immediately oriented their weapons up at us. And of course, you know, we're coming over the top of the target. We're doing what we're not supposed to do. You can see the tracers all around my cockpit, and this guy is hammering right at us. You just get low in your seat and hope the aircraft holds together. Corn and Mark disregarded the ceasefire call, and they laid waste to everything underneath us. Oh, he's shooting. So now as we're coming back around, Mark have made that initial pass and they've made a right turn um, very aggressively. He's engaging a second time as we are now coming back in to cover him and to get his to cover his break. But at that time they are low and that turn likely put off a significant amount of their airspeed. And they were overwhelmed with enemy fire. So an RPG hit between the two crew stations, severed the controls between the two crew stations. An RPG hit the main transmission. The aircraft basically was riddled. Um, but most likely, the, the, the worst was a uh, 14 half millimeter to the pilot crew station. So it appears that corn was shot in the air. Uh, and evidently, Mark was alive to the ground um, with no way to, to affect the controls. Of course, I'm heads down setting up the weapon systems for the next pass, and so I don't see that happen. But Johnny, of course, is in the back seat and keeping your eye on the other aircraft the whole time. So uh, he saw that, he witnessed that happen. Yes, uh, fallen angel, fallen angel. And uh, made me aware. I looked, I looked up and out and realized what happened um, and made the call. Um, fallen Angel. We have a Fallen Angel. Repeat, Fallen Angel. We have aircraft down. Fallen Angel. Looks like he took fire from that uh, location. Grid to follow. And then in shock, I think I said something along the lines of, you know, you know, grids this and, you know, requesting permission to fire. And the JTAC, um, awesome guy. I would very much like to meet this guy. Snapped me out of it immediately. He said, forget the grid. Kill everything. Roger, forget the grid. Kill everything around that vehicle. Over. Good copy. Coming in hot. We came in um, and we got off a few, uh, uh, a few shots. All right, I got flashes wise. We don't have a gun. This man, this sucks. Our aircraft had a had some mechanical issues. Um, the gun wasn't working. The laser wasn't working. Um, that's kind of a big deal. So we're handicapped a little bit, and now we're alone. Uh, but we're not leaving. Um, at about that time, a uh, voice cracked over the radio, and it was Zach Johnson. This is Zach, folks. We got a death on top of we are currently in route. Over. And immediately, um, a thousand pounds came off my shoulders. Um, a friendly voice on the radio, and help is on the way. So now we're in need of help, and there's two Apaches screaming. They didn't wait for clearance. They didn't. They didn't talk to anybody, they didn't ask permission, they didn't wait for an op order, they didn't do any of that. They heard that call, they were monitoring the, 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 the battle on the radio and immediately departed. I believe it was Mike Leipold that, uh, he said, hey, did you hear? Uh, we got a fallen angel. 
And I, we hadn't. I hadn't. The last thing I expected, you know, because we were invincible. And um, so I, I said, who is it? And he said, we don't know. And um, so I got on my, my bicycle that I had there to get around Taji and uh, went directly to the talk. And I was battle captain at this time. So I was probably needed to head there anyway to do my shift eventually. But I remember I was in PTs and I, I just hauled ass to the talk and I went in, poked my head around the corner and they had the big TV screen with the, uh, the UAV footage. Uh, I wanted to know who the crew was, but I didn't want to know who the crew was at the same time. Um, and then I asked and they said it was Resh and Chow. At the time, we didn't know if they had gotten out of the cockpit. Um, there was there was wood lines there. They you know in in our, in our mind in our hearts I think that's what we wanted to believe. Um, but then it came out that they were still in the cockpit. There were dudes running all over the place, and we get into our office and we're asking, hey, what's going on? Platoon sergeant tells us it was a fallen angel. Well, of course, we knew what that meant. So we're asking, who was it? Who, what happened? Who was it? Whose aircraft? Um, and we found out it was Captain Resch and uh, Mr. Chow. And uh, we all knew those guys. So we, you know, we grab our uh, bags with our, you know, light wing cords and stuff in it, and we run out to the flight line. Every bird was at least up on the APU and ready to go, ready to fly. People running everywhere, loading us up with everything we could carry as far as ammunition was concerned. It was a lot of activity going on. I remember seeing the uh, our Sergeant Major out there actually loading rockets at one point. Now you see the Sergeant Major out there doing that? That's, that's okay, it's serious, something's going down. From that point on, I remember launching aircraft, but everything's kind of a blur. It just kind of runs together. It was a very long day. Uh, and as I recall, we actually, our next shift came in and most of us kept working for at least another hour or so before they told us, hey, you need to get off the line. Because I mean, at that point for us, we've been on for over 12 hours, it's a safety concern. We started to get these reports every like five to 10 minutes that they were 25 anti-Iraqi forces gathered. Next five minutes, it grew to 50. Next five minutes, it grew to 100. By the time we got done, it grew to about 500 anti-Iraqi forces that are gathered to fight. When it takes you 30 minutes to fly someplace, you know, and people are giving you updates like that, it gives you time to think and, and you know, it's like, what, you know, what the hell is going on down here? So we get in the FARC, we get an update. They want us to go down and do a battle handover with one of the big gun teams that was down there. So we took off from the FARC, went down there. We were established out to the west of the crash site and where there was a friendly special forces unit that was attempting to secure the crash site. So we got out to the west and we set up an orbit out there and started looking in towards where the crash site was. And I think as soon as we rolled out inbound, my front seater, Jay Hunt, like saw 15, 20 guys like lined up on a berm, like pointed towards the friendlies. I remember seeing a, a ditch, this big long ditch and these guys running back and forth in this ditch, this this good dugout area, and it was a lot of guys. I got multiple personnel in the berm walking back and forth. And this was Jay's like first actual engagement like he'd ever done. So on my displays on the underlay, I had Jay's video. So I looked down there and sure enough, there's all these guys lined up. And if you look further down, there was another group of individuals. Hey, I got multiple personnel on the corner of that berm. There's all these guys lined up with weapons, shooting, unbeknownst to me. Uh, there was an F-16 up there that, like, dropped a bomb. Something just blew, Something up. Just blew up. So I call up Lead. I go, did the Air Force just drop a bomb? Because he's the guy talking to the JTAC and everything. And, uh, he, and he goes, just stand by, you know, and he made a call. And he goes, yeah, they just dropped a bomb. So like, well, that'd be nice to know. There was a bunch of assets on, on station, but nobody was talking to each other because everybody had different parts of the picture and there was no clarity. And we started to engage. We're coming inbound and the wind's pretty much howling, like about 30 miles an hour or so it turned out. So Jay's got the gun was, and was means he got an action to ready to fire. 
and uh, I'm telling him like you know based on my previous experience like as soon as the first rounds hit like they're gonna scatter they're gonna run everywhere yeah they're gonna start running as soon as he shoots so uh, I can see him with my naked eye right now so Lee does its engagement They break off, they call outbound, I call them in sight. So now we're in hot and Jay shoots the cannon at those group of individuals. Rounds start hitting and they just stay there. And that's like the weirdest thing. It's like, I don't know what's going on. So, you know, we turn outbound and we come back in. So by that time, those guys on the berm had jumped into the trench line and we fired flechettes into the trench line. It's about like 1,400 steel darts that come out of this rocket at a predetermined range and they spread out and it's for dispersed troops in the open. We continued to service that target and then we got pushed over. There was a like a little building adjacent to where the aircraft had crashed. That building that's immediately east, about 100 meters or so to the uh, crash site. There's guys in there that keep popping up and shooting. You got eyes onto that, what he's talking about. Roger, I got the building. So we began to engage it. We went Winchester, which means we're out of ammo. So we had to go back to the far, rearm, came back to the target. We ended up being on station with that for about 10 hours. By the time we cycled through the FARP again, there were like at least a couple of teams in there waiting to go. So it was dark by then. I think I had to cycle through the FARP one more time and then we went back to Taji. We ended up going in uh, after dark, and I remember flying down there, taking off from Kelzoo, and seeing the AC-130 overhead and actually shooting. So you'd see like the muzzle flashes. I remember the winds down there, uh, and I remember coming inbound with a 45 knot crosswind and just crabbing all the way into the target, trying to like, how am I gonna get anything off the aircraft to be any kind of accurate? Not only do you have the AC-130s, the JTACs were doing a hell of a job running them, running A-10s. Uh, and they, I remember seeing an A-10 under goggles that was um, well below the hard deck. And just seeing his formation lights as he pitched up and was below our flight uh, and climbing back up to the coordinating altitude. And it's like, I was going I remember being to him like, hey man, you gotta, you know, keep your head on a swivel. There's a, it's, it's busy <laughs> down here. But I remember being on station when uh, uh, the ground force commander called us and they said, hey, we got your boys. Um, that they'd, they'd made it to the uh, to the wreckage and actually had, had got them out of the aircraft. I remember the ground force commander saying, hey, we've got your boys. Sir, say again, understand, what do you mean you have our boys? He said, I have two heroes in my possession. And that was kind of a calming feeling. Um, I immediately called Captain Annerly and I said, hey, relay back to the rear that they have our heroes. And to know what those guys on the ground, those operators, went through to fight to get to the crash site. And they were still out there fighting when we were out there. They spent probably a good 24, 36 hours on that objective. I remember coming back, second time on the objective, call a gun to, I said, hey, let's take a different approach. I said, everyone's been coming in the same way. Let's bump to about 2,000 feet. Call and make sure that we got clearance because you had a UAV on station at five, Spectre gunship at seven, Eagle six at 10,000. We got a stack, so we got a clear airspace. I said, let's run along the river. I just want to see something. I tell gun two, I'm going to throw some sparkle out there and get everybody's eyes to look on this river. And lo and behold, there's guys laying on the riverbank, just a ton of them. And I'm like, Called Eagle Six on the hey, do you see the enemy on the riverbank? I do. So we push back off to the south, call Spectre Gunship. He's got to come around and he's dropping 40 millimeters. I think he even dropped a 105 on him. There was no enemy, no more along that riverbank. They were gone. And I remember Eagle Six go, Well, big guns, I think your night might be done with that one. 
and I remember that distinct radio call. Your, your night might be done with that one. And I remember getting kind of a chuckle out of that. I remember Matt Silverman in the back seat going, that was pretty badass. This was an anomaly in Iraq. This was just unlike any other engagement that I know of that happened during that conflict, because it's like some kind of suicide, you know, cult kind of thing. The reason that we found out later that these guys hadn't run was they'd shot themselves full of atropine. They were high as a kite. An unfortunate situation. People did went above and beyond the call. Uh, people were just doing amazing things. Uh, it's just, you know, it's unfortunate that we lost two good soldiers that day. Where in the world, in the history of warfare, would you ever find four soldiers that are willing to bend it over and do whatever they could to go and engage 600 to 800 fortified enemy combatants. And we just absolutely, without hesitation, could not wait to be the first ones down there to get into this fight. Had Corn and Mark not done what they did, I wouldn't be alive today. And at the same time, like, we're all gonna leave this world. They left this world in the absolute most heroic way possible. Front towards enemy, guns blazing, doing what we do, and lost their lives in, in the defense of their wingman, and I was that wingman. I'm honored, and I live every day to make sure that their sacrifice was worth it, and we will forever be united by those that came before us and sacrificed their lives so that we could be here. So, Corn and Mark did that for me, but they did it for you too. I didn't get to participate in, in that fight. Um, and I, I have guilt about that. Um, it's not my fault that I wasn't on rotation to do that. I, I acknowledge that, but Mark was a friend of mine. And um, I, I, I think that I will always carry that with me because I, I wasn't able to you know, link arms with the guys who who did that on that day. Um, it was it was an incredible effort um, that went on, and the stories that came back were amazing. I mean, I, these guys are heroes, truly, and I don't throw that word around at all. As everything was hitting the fan, and we, we confirmed, you know, which aircraft it was, I was tagged to be. It's called the summary court martial officer, uh, the SCOMO. This was a system that we were exercising that we had never used before. This was the first shoot down. And so I was asked to be the SCOMO for Mark, and I didn't know what that entailed. Um, and when they told me that it would mean that I would go through his trailer and, and, and document every single personal item that he had on paper, um, I thought, okay, I can, I can do that. You know, if, if that's all I can do to help, that's what I'll do. And I'm telling you, brother, that was, that was a hard, that's a hard thing. You know, for, for all the combat that, that we saw and, and all the, all the things that we did that should have been more mentally or emotionally tolling, um, that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. You know, uh, I kept waiting for him to walk in with his backpack over his shoulder and and with that smile like, what are you doing what are you doing in my room you know and it just never happened so uh yeah that's pretty rough It's interesting, Matt Skyver came up to me, you know, Matt's old country boy way of, of thinking and saying things. 
he just kind of looked at me and he said, you know, he goes, if we think we're going to go up there and not lose somebody, you're crazy. And that kind of resonated with me. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic or defeatist, but that kind of, you know, rung a bell. Then we got up there, it became very evident that they didn't like us there. It was always kind of a dichotomy because a lot of times you're, you know, every time you're expecting to get shot at, but most of the times you would show up to a tick that's either subsided or even during the middle of it, as soon as they can hear the aircraft, they would scurry. But then, you know, those times that you would show up and the dedicated ones would stay and, and they would fight it out with you, you know, until the end. When we got there in September of 06, the threat had changed from what we had seen in the previous rotation where there was... Uh, I think 4th Infantry Division had lost a couple Apaches to confirmed surface-to-air missiles. So those were starting to proliferate in theater. The enemy was getting better at their tactics for shooting down aircraft, setting up anti-aircraft ambushes. And then starting in January of 07, we started to see routinely aircraft being shot down or shot up. Morbidly, you know, one of those things that I don't really talk a whole lot about is, you know, every morning I would wake up and I'd be like, I wonder if this is it. You know, it's in the back of your head because, you know, you're going to strap it on and you're going to go out there and people are going to shoot at you. That was a fact. And it's awesome that helicopters are so loud because you have really no conception of how much you're being shot at, you know. So, you know, that there was a it's there's a benefit to having that fan over your head. You don't I don't think you stress as much about it as maybe you should. But. When you talk to the ground units and they ask if you're okay and you're like, yeah, I'm good to go. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're getting lit up over there. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I won't go back there. <laughs> the enemy was dynamic from the beginning to the end, the way that they were targeting American forces on the ground, but aircraft specifically morphed. And it seemed like that all came to a head uh, around January of 07. They really started to figure out how to get at us. They had observed us for long enough to understand how we did business and they adapted. Some of the pilots had bounties on their heads from Muqtada al Sadr by name. They knew us. When we came out on the AO, they knew who they were dealing with and there was a fear, but there was also a hate. I mean, you it was palpable. Bad guys wanted a piece of us. People who say that the enemy, they're stupid. They're not stupid, they're, they're learning. The dumb ones get killed off pretty early. But the guys who are smart, they watch and they learn and they develop their own tactics and procedures to use against us. So identifying patterns that we're setting and avoiding them or changing them on purpose to make us harder to engage or determine what our actions are gonna be uh, is really critical uh, in aviation. And when you don't do that, uh, the result can be absolutely deadly. I was the new guy. And on top of being the new guy, I was the new lieutenant, which everybody hates lieutenants. <laughs> Everybody had kind of trained together and, and established bonds and friendships. So I was the new guy trying to trying to be cool with everybody. And the very first guy who, who came up to me, it was uh, Keith Yoakum. We had company t-shirts that we wore underneath our ABDUs. He brought me two or three shirts and said, hey, LT, you hang with me and I'm gonna make sure you're successful. Keith taught me so, so much. And not just about the aircraft or about maintenance, but just about how to be how to be a good leader and, and how to be, you know, somebody that people can respect. But that, I just remember when I got there, I was like, man, that's, you know, everybody's kind of hesitant to, to befriend the new guy except for Keith. And he was the first guy to throw his hand out and say, welcome to the team. The words that come to mind to me when I think about Keith Yoakum are servant leader. The idea that if you want to be first, you should be the last. And that was Keith's ethos that he lived. I learned probably more about leadership from him than anybody else. Probably my first memories of Keith were him face down in the Apache cockpit with a can of pledge and a shop towel, working with his crew chiefs to get the cockpits as clean as he could get them. And that was just kind of what he did. And he didn't do that for show, that was just who he was. 
um, because he wanted to, he just had a lot of pride in what he did. Every troop always seems to have that, that warrant officer, that informal leader that you, that you lean on. And Keith was definitely the senior warrant that everybody looked up to within the troop. Keith came into the troop and he was a force. Every time you see somebody like that, who's experienced and knowledgeable and confident, people gravitate towards that. He was one of those guys that came in and we had a really good troop, but he kind of gelled it. He pulled us all together and he, he, gave, he gave us the direction. So like I was a young W2 and I was running with my hair on fire. A lot of times he'd pull us aside and be like, you're doing great things, but did you think about this? So that mentorship um, was critical. So Jason, uh... Jason was one of those people that um, was hard to get to know. So he had a big physical exterior. He's like a big, strong guy. So he's like a little intimidating, but on the other side of the coin, the people that were his good friends, I mean, he was a true good friend to them. And you could just tell that they really valued him for his friendship and his candor and his humor. He had one of those quiet sense of humors. Mr. DeFriend was an awesome guy. He was a guy that would go to bat for you 100%. If you told him that you were having an issue with something, he would look you in the eye and say, hey, you want me to take care of that for you? And he meant it. He was a Herculean guy with a heart of gold, and he was a big part of our company. Jason and I kind of grew up, and we came over from Germany together, actually. And uh, we met in Germany, and he kind of kind of took me on as his, as his little brother because he had spent some time in the Army. and done the ins and outs. He was a quiet guy, and he was also someone that would do everything he could for you, whatever he could, whatever he asked for. He would be there. Jason was my roommate, um, and oh my gosh, he was so, our, our room was so filthy, and we were, we were constantly ridiculed about this. I had just told him, dude, you've, you've got to clean this freaking room up. It's, it's nasty, and, and mine was nasty too, and he would say the same thing about me, but uh, we were on opposite shifts, so I was flying nights, he was flying days. And uh, so after that short conversation between the two of us about, hey, you clean your room up, you clean your room up, and uh, I think he said uh, some choice words to me, and it was all in jest, but uh, walked out the door. And uh, about four or five hours later, Jeff Weaver came into my room and he was shaking me, and at, at first I was I was really mad because I'm, I'm like Jeff, you know, you know I'm uh, I'm flying nights, and you're waking me up in in the middle of my you know sleep. Um, it didn't occur to me that he had something important to say. At first I was just mad about it, and then I I could tell by the look of his face that something something was up, and uh, he said, Hey man, I need you to sit up. So I sat up on the bed and put my feet on the floor and I could see, uh, you know, I could see the look on his face was, was, it was obvious it was something really bad. And he said, hey man, uh, Jason's dead. And uh, I just remember, uh, uh, I just remember being completely shocked and taken aback by it um, because the people that I was with are invincible. Um, the people that I that I worked with and for uh, were gods of the sky, and that that wasn't going to happen to them. So I just uh, I, I remember even even now as I'm I'm telling you about it, I'm still shocked that it happened. Keith and Jason and uh, Jeremy and Jeff were, were coming up to replace us. I was flying with Don Washerbaum in his front seat. Myself and um, CW3 Brian Haas, we had just finished a mission. We were on our way back. We were getting the aircraft all fueled up for the next uh, shift. Eric Hoskinson was in my front seat. We were winging. The uh, lead aircraft was Don Washerbaum in back and the other Brian Haas in front. I had just done my battle handover talking to Keith and Jason. Last words I heard from Keith were, all right, brother, see you at breakfast. 
we departed Taji um, to the northwest. And I remember clearing over MSR Tampa. The sun was coming up. It was going to be a beautiful day. So there was a dried up little lake bed out to the northwest of Taji where we used to go test fire. It was an improved test fire zone, so we wanted to make sure weapon systems were operating ready to go. There were several areas where we conduct test fires, and apparently we weren't the only ones that were aware of our areas. So the enemy combatants had essentially set up a, a triangle shaped ambush. Rounds were coming from everywhere. And I was flight lead, and I flew right through the middle of it. I never saw a single thing. Keith immediately got on the radio. And was calling rounds, taking fire, taking fire, telling me which way to go. Guiding me from the rear, avoiding the rest of the ambush, essentially got me free. We got out of the ambush and uh, began to formulate a plan. Keith was reporting up the, the damage that his aircraft had sustained. All right, just be advised, we can't shoot anything. We got no utility hydraulics left. I asked Keith, do you feel comfortable continuing? Do you want to return to base? At no point did he ever want to return to base. Him and Jason had talked in their cockpit, and they had determined they wanted to get after the enemy. We are going to ensure that Whoever did this would not get the second chance to engage another aircraft. All right, we're going to set up. I'm going to come back around the right. Set up off these combat spread. We're going to do a racetrack inbound. We rolled in. Keith announced over the radios how he would be able to support me being lead and being trail. He was going to cover my break with fixed guns, fixed rockets if necessary. Hey, I can put rockets in. That's about the only thing I can do. I'm going to climb up and uh, cover you from high, and we're going to work on rockets, all right? Keith climbed a little bit higher so that he could immediately suppress with the fixed rockets, um, knowing his aircraft was damaged and uh, a lot of his weapon systems weren't functioning at their best. We know where they're at. Let's don't get too close. Let's find them. You find them. We got you covered. Just like every other time before, calling inbound, we're calling you know, guns hot, guns cold, breaking right, breaking left. Normally, you get the phone call from Trail saying, Roger, still on your six or off your right, off your left. Um, it was about the second turn. We got no phone call. Keith, you with me? Keith, you are you with me? Um, so I banked right, looked out the top of my canopy, and saw fire. So at that point, it was a mission change. We were no longer worried about the bad guy. We were, we were ensuring that that was Keith and Jason. When I saw the crash, um, we flew towards it to confirm that that's, in fact, Keith and Jason. Um, once confirmed, I had um, Lieutenant Jeff Weaver in the front seat immediately start calling ground force to coordinate, um, secure the scene. Um, I immediately called over Taji Tower, announced Fallen Angel, passed grid and zone. And then I got on and was speaking to uh, our talk announced the Fallen Angel call, and they scrambled another crew to get out there. That's when they called, and we were flying out to give them some air support, and all of a sudden, the radios went quiet. And um, we weren't sure, you know, because we knew that they had a lot going on. So we were like, OK, you know, just give them a second to, you know, maybe get back to me. And I just remember, you know, calling out to him, you know, hey, let me know what's going on. And we didn't hear nothing from him. And then we saw the smoke off in the distance, probably about 10 miles. I remember Keith on the radio, like, hey, I, you know, I don't have hydraulics, but I'm going to climb and go fix rockets. I remember hearing the static on the radio. You know, just, I remember the, just going straight to my gut, you know. Just, you don't want to know, but you know. And, uh, I just remember seeing the, the smoke trail from the aircraft. I remember flying over the smoke and looking for Jeremy and Jeff, looking for the aircraft and trying to scoop them up into our team so they weren't separated. And then uh, coming and flying over over the aircraft, and not wanting to believe it, still looking at it. Like it just <clears throat> didn't look recognizable, you know, and then I saw an engine and uh, coming around the left side, I remember seeing the tail boom and the uh, Captain America that they had drawn on there. 
And it's just one of those pictures that you snap to the scene that tail boom lay and, you know, a few hundred yards away from where the actual aircraft was. Brian and myself, we, uh, we discussed landing and going over there and seeing maybe somebody's alive inside the aircraft. But there, we would have caused, we would have made a bad situation worse because the, the 30 millimeter was exploding, the rockets were exploding. There's still Hellfire missiles there, you know, that could detonate. And we stayed on scene as long as we could. We, we asked for extension to stay there until the, the crash site could be properly um, secured. And uh, there was some confusion on to who it was that went down. The hardest radio call I ever made was, you know, keeping Jason, this aircraft down. And they kept asking, are there survivors? Negative. And for some reason, that question and negative wasn't going through. So having to spell it out, you know, the crew is dead. I mean, there's no, no chance of anything otherwise. And, uh, spent a few more hours out there until we finally got called back in and they had someone else come and relieve us. And I remember coming down to the flight line. I didn't know what happened yet, but I remember the mood was changed. And there seemed to be a sadness and a hustle going on on the flight line. And I really didn't know what was going on. And then somebody told me. And it hit at that point, like, oh, man, we just lost a crew. And I saw all of Alpha Company there standing around. And those guys just, they were trying to push through, but man, you, you, you saw the pain. And it's funny because, you know what I learned that day? Believe it or not, you know what I learned? The mission don't stop because you lost somebody. Just watching and seeing everything happen and still you have to go support other guys that have other missions going on, yet we just lost two of our prime members of the team and we can't even warn these guys now. You gotta push it in the back of your head because you got a mission to do. That sucks. That sucks really bad. I feel like the mood changed throughout the battalion. For me as a new guy, like this is my first experience with it. it there, there was a healthy dose of fear. All the aircraft that were shot down during that time, it, it was, you just knew that, that, that you, weren't, you weren't as safe as you thought you were. You know, I've, I've worn Keith and Jason's name on my wrist since that rotation, both to honor their memory and, and to remind myself to not always dig my fangs in the floorboard and go after the enemy at all costs. We realized that if, if the enemy had engaged us, the enemy got to vote, and we may have significant damage to the helicopter that we don't know about. We're there to support the troops on the ground. If I do something and put a helicopter on the ground outside the wire, so to speak, well, now we've become the main effort, not just for the people's battle space we're in, but usually for the entire theater. So we're diverting assets to our crash site that should be enabling and protecting ground forces throughout the entire theater. I thought about this a lot. We had a pattern that we always did. Now, if we would have broke that pattern, could have saved their lives, probably, maybe. If they would have left 10 minutes early, could they could have found them, I don't know. We did the same things over and over every day. Out east to test fire, out west to test fire. That was, that was a pretty sad day. It actually still is. Then Captain Lee Robinson got us all together. He had just taken command of the company. You know, what a way to walk into a leadership role in a brand new group of guys. Um, I remember he called us together and um, he prayed with us. Uh, he, he actually led us in prayer, and, and that was the single moment that I grew up. It changed my entire outlook on being a gun pilot, on our business, and the gravity of it, what, what we were really responsible for, what can really happen to us. And uh, I'll never forget those guys. When you look at the Army regulations for um, 
for the two highest valid awards, so the Medal of Honor and the Singular Service Cross. Both of them say they're for act, acts of heroism so notable and uh, risk of life so extraordinary as to separate you from your comrades. And I felt like that's what I saw. There was an ambush site with multiple positions and Keith and Jason's aircraft was struck. And what they didn't know is that a fire had started towards the tail boom of the aircraft. Their initial indications was that they had lost their utility hydraulics. So they decided to take a badly wounded aircraft back into an active ambush site to find and kill the enemy. I thought, I thought that was heroism above and beyond the call of duty. And then in terms of risk of life, um, so extraordinary as to separate you from your comrades. When you have that condition, when you lose utility hydraulics like that, you lose a couple of critical systems in the aircraft. Our gun articulates in terms of where either the co-pilot gunner or the pilot is looking. So you lose the ability to do that. And you also lose the ability for your rocket pods to articulate. Um, so essentially, if you want to put fire on the enemy and be effective on it, you have to climb your aircraft and then go into a dive. So that's what Keith and Jason decided to do. They decided to climb, which put them at more risk of further fire in that ambush site. It was clear to me that they showed un uncommon valor and it was my obligation or responsibility to put them up for the highest award that I could possibly get for them. And of course, in hindsight, we'd look back and, and I wish that Keith and Jason would have brought the aircraft back home, but I think there's a couple of reasons that they didn't. On January the 20th, a Black Hawk was shot down east of Baghdad, call sign easy 4 zero. And Keith was one of the first aircraft to respond to that scene. So he knew these tactics. He knew what this enemy was doing and that they were doing it repeatedly. And if we didn't go and find and destroy them, that they would do it again. So I think he and Jason were committed to, to finding them that day. Another thing is Keith was a senior maintenance pilot in the company and one of the most senior maintenance pilots in the battalion. It was impossible for he and Jason to know based upon the indications they had in the cockpit that a fire had developed. So I think he, he used his best judgment knowing that although he had a wounded aircraft, he still had some time available with it. I was extremely proud of who they were. I felt like they died as they lived. They died in service to others. One of my proudest moments in the Army is when um, we finally got the word that uh, the Distinguished Service Cross would be bestowed upon Keith and the Distinguished Flying Cross upon Jason for their actions that day. It takes a special kind of person to be a crew chief, I think. Got to have a little bit of grit to do it, and you just got to be focused, I think, because you're working on a piece of machinery that takes somebody up every day and affects the lives of people on the ground, so it's pretty important. Everybody has pride in their aircraft. It becomes a part of you. Its success is your success as a crew chief, and you want to see it do great things. So when I see my aircraft taking off, it means that you've done your job. A uh, crew chief is responsible for the daily upkeep of the aircraft and the logbook, daily maintenance and inspections. You start out your day with uh, overall a general daily inspection. That alone takes roughly an hour, maybe a little bit more to do, just to make sure the aircraft is flyable. That's your whole point. When I was training to actually be a mechanic on these aircraft, it was super exciting. I'd never messed with anything like that before. That was amazing. But over time, it became monotonous. It was routine. I didn't hate my job, but it, it wasn't anything special until you get to the moment when the aircraft is launching. And as a crew chief, I was looked forward to launching an aircraft. Getting the pushback from the rotor wash was always awesome, but nothing beats seeing like an entire flight line up and moving. Battle damage was occurring all the time ranging anywhere from the stray bullet hole through the tail beam to uh, 12 six rounds being lodged in the uh, the blast shield to mortar rounds hitting, it looks like a shotgun hit the whole aircraft and having to deal with the aircraft that we lost catastrophically, having to get those back. That daily grind was a lot different. The amount of aircraft we had to have 24 hours a day to cover the mission windows was 16. We started off with 26, lost two, and with guys going out and getting shot up all the time. And, and also, you know, the amount of flight hours. I mean, back home, at a, one tail number may fly 90 hours a year. There, they were flying 90 hours a month. 
So all the unscheduled and scheduled maintenance was astronomical. Our crew chiefs are amazing. They're out there, you know, they're doing a really hard job. They're out there in that heat all day long. They don't get to fly. They get to see us take off and they have a pride in that. We've got to trust them and they've got to trust us. You know, we're putting our lives in, in their hands, literally. They're amazing, they're professional. They joke around with us, we joke around with them. And just like any job, you know, you get, you get upset at each other, you know, but at the end of the day, you're shaking hands and playing cards or something. <laughs> the aircraft belongs to the crew chief. That's his aircraft. It's his baby, he takes care of it day in and day out. So when he's saluting the pilots, he's releasing it to their charge, to their care. And it's theirs until it gets back down onto the ground. You don't know if she's gonna see the aircraft or those pilots again. They're putting their lives on the line, in all honesty. And I'm sitting back here on the fob. I'm about to go to the chow hall, get me something to eat. So I, I, it's definitely worthwhile to give them, give them their respect. Tarmillo is one of those towns that you'd fly over and it just kind of give you the willies because it was a fairly large town in terms of where it was. I mean, it was pretty far to northeast of Baghdad. Um, but you would fly around it and it would just be eerily quiet. I mean, just eerily quiet. Um, lots of buildings, but not much you know, activity. Um, and then we knew that there was that small outpost on the, uh, on the north side of it. Um, and those guys had a tough mission. We replaced Bravo Company 164 Armor. Bravo Company was responsible for Tarmia. It was an Iraqi police station in which the local unit there was partnered with the Iraqi police agency currently on the ground. The insurgent force was so strong there that the number of Iraqi police, I think, had dwindled to about five that actually showed up for work. Most of them walked off the job because they were getting intimidated after work. At that point in time, the security situation in Tarmi had degraded to the point where they were pretty much in direct contact with the threat the minute they left the gate. Tarmia was about 12 kilometers north of Taji, straight line distance. But to get there, you actually had to go on the main logistics artery of Iraq, referred to as main supply route, Tampa. Take that all the way up to a place called Checkpoint 59 Alpha. That's in a village called Mushada. Head east on a route called Coyotes, which was a really, really bad tier one IED site. And then you made it to Tarmia. It was about a 20 minute trip. Route Coyotes was so bad that in order to get any sort of logistics package into Tarmia, you had to dismount clear about a seven kilometer section of elephant grass. Elephant grass is about six feet high. It's very thick, it's very hot. All the humidity just sits in there. There was little to no visibility to where all the trigger points were. These guys had all the advantage. It, they could just sit there and just detonate IED after IED and just be completely invisible. The first mission we go out, we're conducting a local engagement and all of a sudden we hear a burst of squad automatic weapon fire go off. We're in contact. Turns out soldiers had established blocking positions and an Opal, which is a very popular car in Iraq, actually tried to bypass a blocking position. The VBIT threat was very high, so the soldier did exactly the right thing. He fired warning shots, he tried to disable the car, and then he shot and wounded the driver. Um, we conducted medevac, the man was completely fine. So everyone was a little rattled from that. The next day, we go and do a dismounted patrol. We go to the northwest of the patrol base, and we're talking to some people, and we have soldiers up on the roof of what we refer to as the Red Crescent building. The Red Crescent is the Iraqi version of the Red Cross. It was a bright blue um, four-story building that really dominated the terrain out there. So we conduct the engagement, and we're walking back, and all of a sudden we hear a crack and Staff Sergeant Copeland leans over the wall and says, Patton's been shot. So we all haul ass up to the top of the building and Specialist Patton had been shot through the throat. 
he was bleeding excessively. Uh, we continued to take contact from the west of the building. We returned and laid down suppressive fire. The enemy at that time decided to break contact. And so we conducted a Kazavac. There was a helicopter landing zone to the west of our patrol base. We evacuated Specialist Patton. He was still breathing when we put him on the bird, but he didn't make it. We get a tip from a local who said, hey, there was a sniper team who was responsible for the death of Specialist Patton. Here's where they live. So we got a building. So we conduct what we called Operation Nice Guy. The intent was to go and conduct a uh, court on the search of that house. We executed that at about 02 on 19 February. We go, conduct a court on a search, detain two individuals. We find a sniper rifle. We find a car. A uh, popular tactic of the insurgents was to knock out the headlights. So we had one hole that could accommodate the rifle scope, the other hole for the actual muzzle. Um, we find that car parked in the garage. So we detain those two men. We escort them back to the patrol base. So we're back in the patrol base around 04. It's still dark. At this point in time, the only people who are up are the roof guards, the sergeant of the guard, and the medic who is running the radio, Specialist Boddington, and myself. Everyone else is asleep. Staff Sergeant Cologne was the sergeant of the guard. He comes in around 05, 0530, and says, hey, sir, I just let you know, um, our gate's locked. Um, everything's quiet. Um, I'm gonna continue to rotate. I'll let you know if anything's different. I'm like, okay. Around 0645, we start taking contact. Just a couple sporadic pot shots here and there. But then it picks up and it gets really, really heavy. I've never heard this volume of fire out there in Iraq. RPGs just start exploding off the buildings. Kids were throwing mortar rounds with fuses lit over the walls. Hand grenades were flying over the walls. It was insane. Third platoon's platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class Housie, was sleeping in the room adjacent to our CP and comes running in. He and I talk to each other, like, we gotta go to the roof and see what's going on. So I throw on my body armor, he throws on his body armor, we walk out to the hall, and all of a sudden, this nuclear bomb goes off. A truck with, I believe it was 1,200 pounds of military-grade explosive crashed through our gate and was driving and was going to crash into the barracks. First Lieutenant Jokinen, shot and killed the driver as he was coming into the barracks. If he had crashed into the barracks, he probably would have killed everybody. At the last minute, the driver crashed into the fuel tank, which was about 30 meters away from the barracks, and then the VBID detonated. Throws myself and Sergeant Housie against the wall. Um, we like bounce, we bounce like ping pong balls down the wall. It was just huge. So I go running back in the talk, Boddington's laying on the ground. He's got glass in his face. Um, he's getting up and I was like, hey man, are you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. So we go running out and it's insane. The fuel tank had detonated. Everything's on fire. All of our Humvees that were parked in there, they're destroyed. There are flat tires. Some of them are burning. There's pieces and parts of Humvees laying all over. And then I look at the barracks. The complete front half of the barracks was gone. It was just a pile of rubble. Whatever's left of the roof is just returning fire. I mean, there's just tracers flying all over. Tracers flying to the roof, tracers flying away from the roof. Hand grenades keep flying over the wall and exploding. All of the soldiers from blue and white platoon, I see them walking around, they're in their underwear, they're in their brown t-shirts. Most of them are bleeding, if not all of them. A few of them are digging their way out of the rocks. I see white platoon's leader, um, First Lieutenant Sean Jokinen, I also see our combo rep, Specialist Bang, Pal Vang. Um, Jokinen's ears are bleeding. He, uh, Vang has a giant chunk missing out of his neck. He's holding his neck. I tell them to go to the CP. We'll figure out what's going on next. Housie and I start helping all these soldiers, the ones who are too bad to walk. Um, we start carrying them back to the CP. There's about five soldiers who 
are so wounded they can't do anything. One of them was PFC Montrell McCarn. Uh, he had a severe head injury and multiple others. Uh, Staff Sergeant Stallings he had severe facial lacerations. PFC Bose. The Bose had a giant six inch piece of glass sticking out of his forehead. So we bring them all to the CP and then we go back and we're helping these other soldiers um, who we're, we're like, okay, you're not hurt, go fight. You're not hurt, go fight. We have a big pile of rifles and weapons that we just kept finding, we kept throwing rifles and weapons at soldiers who were able to fight. We kept sending them up to the roof. So at that point in time, we got everyone back. Roof guards were turning fire. The enemy was bounding, trying to get into the giant hole in the wall. We estimate anywhere between one to 200 people were attacking us. So my first response is try to get on the radio. So I get the radio, no power. The, the blast had destroyed the generator. So Vang, who is missing a giant chunk out of his neck, I'm like, hey, we have to go get the generator up. Sergeant First Class Housey, the uh, third platoon sergeant, said, hey, I found a Harris radio, which at the time was like super modern. Um, I'm gonna go up to the roof and try to get comms. So he took a, an extended antenna and went up and tried to get comms with our battalion, which was, you know, about, I don't know, seven to 10 kilometers away. So Vang and I go out to the generator and all the time Vang's bleeding. Um, and he and I start trying to figure out how to troubleshoot the generator. Whenever he get up, he would climb up at the top of the generator. Um, people would start shooting at him, bullets would ping around. He just ignored him, he kept working. Um, I mean, this, this, this kid had guts he was, and he just, he just was ignoring everything, trying to get the generator up. And he looked at me, he's like, sir, this generator's screwed. We don't, we don't have any power. And at that point in time, I mean, I, that's when I felt like just abject terror, because um, I knew there was nothing we could do. But Vang um, looked at me and he's like, hey, I think I know where some ASAP batteries are at, um, regular batteries. I'm like, do you, Vang? He's like, yeah, like, yeah there, were, there were some in the CP. I'll go fix the antenna. I'll throw these batteries in our in our CP radio and we'll get comms that way. I'm like, all right, go. I remember everybody getting the trucks and saying, hey, we got to leave now. And people were just, I seen trucks burning out of the gate. And I seen everybody on the radio. And it was a panic. And I got to brief what was going on. They said, Tarmia just got hit by a pretty bad V-bid. And I was like, we got to get out there now. And uh, we didn't have time to say, you know, how bad is it? We just jumped in the trucks. Well, that's the fastest we were ever allowed to drive without getting chewed out by the SAR Major. Uh, we, we tested those turbochargers and every one of those Humvees getting out there that day. That morning, we happened to be getting ready to go fly. We had the two Brian Hawses in the lead aircraft that day. And myself and Captain Hudson were in the trail aircraft. And just right outside of Camp Taji, uh, we had troops in contact. They weren't but a couple minutes away. A guy with a rifle fired a shot at the convoy, runs in the house. They dismount, go up to the house, and they're getting ready to breach the door. And the guy's on the other side of the door, and he just starts rocking through the door with a machine gun. They back off and call and go, hey, can you take the house down? And they're like, of course we can. How do you want it taken down? Do you have missiles? Yes, we do. We ended up firing on that house, uh, put missiles, put 30. Go ahead. Going to gun. Roger. Firing. Roger, good hit. The guy survived. He, he gave up, you know, after, after all that. So we flew back to Camp Taji to uh, refuel and rearm and uh, get ready for, you know, just our, our oncoming missions. While sitting in the FARP, I could see a plume of black smoke up to the northeast. And I remember asking Eric, you know, what do you think that is? You know, I wonder if we're going to be going to investigate that next. We we're taking on fuel at the time, and the radio from the talk was, was calling us. And of course, taking on fuel, we couldn't answer the radio. Patrol Base North has been attacked by VBID, small arms, RPGs, break. Currently on fire with 18 coalition forces wounded. Uh, they're monitoring this net, call sign patrol base north, over. Oddly enough, when uh, put, in the, put it in as a target, seven minutes away. <laughs> Same seven minutes as we were from Keith and Jason. You could hear, hear the excitement in the voices on the radio. Hey, Chris, on zero three, this is patrol base north, over. Patrol base north, this is Chris, over zero three. We are approximately three minutes and 14 seconds south from you. Uh, you can see a sit rep, over. 
Talk about slow motion. You know, you're pulling as much power in as you can. You're heavy with fuel. You're heavy with ammo, everything. So, you know, you're trying to go as fast as you can, trying to get there. Having Brian get low as possible. You know, I want to come in there and be a surprise. Basically skimming the palm trees from Tampa all the way up towards Armia. Patrol base north, I understand you are also receiving from the south side, so northwest and south. We are getting there as soon as we can for you, sir. Roger, they is spotted a um, small off fire from the, from the south side from the soccer field to the uh, west. Over. And this is Crazy Horse 3, Roger. Uh, why do these flights take so fucking long? You could hear everything in the background going off, gunfire explosions. This wasn't your normal everyday firefight that we were headed into. Got there as quick as we could, uh, established uh, an orbit best we could around the perimeter of the JSS, uh, attempting to get a fix on where the heaviest of the sustained fire was coming from. We did a, a flyby, I remember uh, the aircraft getting hit. One of the questions you asked when you were trying to prepare for the unknown was like, hey, well, how do I know if it, and everybody's like, well, you'll know if it sounds like somebody's throwing a bunch of rocks at your aircraft. Uh, and that is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> we drew the fire right away from them, which turned out good. They were finally able to get their casualties pulled off the roof, pulled in, whatever the case may be. So we did a few turns looking for anything, and we couldn't see anything. Yet listening to the LT on the radio, and he's telling us, you know, you're getting shot at RPG, small arms fire, machine gun fire. And from our view in front of us, there's not a person in the street or anything. I mean, we're just sitting there going. 13, I don't see anybody. I see anyone on the We can't do anything. I mean, outside of letting them shoot at us so you can get your guys back. But then I think it was, it was our second or third time through. Uh, took a pretty good shot in the tail rotor. We might have just got tagged in our tail. Felt it a little bit in the pedals. Looked around and, you know, everything seemed good on the systems. But, you know, I wanted to go with the most conservative choice, especially having a new LT in the back seat, doing all the flying. And, you know, explain to him, I was like, hey, here's where we are. Took around. Technically, we should be returning to base. But everything looks good. What do you think? Lieutenant House like, well, I guess we're going to stay because if we were going to return to base, you would have just told me head back towards Taji. The fact that you're actually asking me means that you're wanting to make sure I'm agreeing with you. We're doing what you want. We're staying for a while. Then we saw a motorcycle headed from the south side of the cop over towards the Tigris River. That motorcycle there, come, up, come over here. I want to look at this. Which way? Okay, uh, got He's out my right door. I just want to see if they have anything on them. And we come up, do a first pass look at the motorcycle. Can't can't see anything on you know there's no weapons or anything like that we flew over a palm grove and all of a sudden my cockpit exploded in my face the thing i immediately saw is the canopy over eric's head that the backseater looks through just immediately spider webbed and i felt the thud underneath uh, the aircraft my seat had taken a direct impact from a dish go around and exploded and but it was enough power that it broke my seat off the hinges and smacked my head into the canopy shattering the canopy above me my flight controls were literally shot and laying on my leg luckily the back seater still has control of everything we had issues with hydraulics everything lit up and i'm still kind of dazed and not sure what was going on uh, i saw the palm grove coming up all I can remember is thinking, oh, that's gonna hurt going into a palm grove, losing your blades, and just, you know, slamming down to the ground about two or 300 feet in the air. Everything was still kind of crazy. I remember making the Mayday call. So us two being the two geniuses we are, turn around and do a 180, 
to protect them, which then just got us shot up by the exact same thing. Hawk, we're ahead too. We're ahead. I have the controls. You have the controls. I have all the controls. So we did another 180. So now we were wing and headed up to the north of Tarmia. At that point, you know, I'm just doing nothing but scrolling through my warnings and cautions. Lieutenant Hudson, he's on the radio reading me his warnings and cautions, you know, hey, what, what should I do, this and that? And meanwhile, they're just going down, going down, going down, going down. I remember seeing rockets shoot off, uh, and I remember seeing a Hellfire motor burning off, and uh, which, of course, was affecting the aircraft as the Hellfire motor was burning, and they're trying to keep it under control. Jettison your rocket pod, jettison your rocket pod. It looks like your rockets are on fire. He tells me, hey, your rockets are cooking off. Get rid of your, your wing stores. Yeah, so arm them, punch them off. Hindsight, I shouldn't have punched them all off, but I did. Probably the last second or two, uh, Captain Hudson, he pulled us out of it. So at this point in time, since I can't see, Brian and Eric are telling me where to turn, to turn back toward Taji. All right, you're looking good right now. You're looking good, Mike. How are you doing? Brian and Brian take all the radio calls. They notify the talk that we're hit. Coming back to Taji, JSS is still taking fire. Uh, you need to get the QRF out here right now to, to launch them, because they're not going to last long. JSS North, Crazy Horse, zero 03 and zero 04, we've both taken fire. We had to uh, jettison weapons and pods. We are headed back to Taj. You did that. We'll send somebody else out. So the Apaches went away. And as soon as they went away, um, things just started right back up again. People started running out of ammunition on the roof. The way we had it set up was our spare ammunition was on the first floor um, of the patrol base. And there was no staircase anymore. It's completely open. So. We had soldiers who were in their underwear and body armor. They grabbed two sleeping bags. They were jumping down parts of the stairs, throwing in ammo, throwing it up, crawling it up, crawling up to the next flight, kept throwing it up and just dumping out ammo on the, on the top of the roof all day. That, that's what they were doing. Eric is having to peer out the front window and the CPG, co-pilot gunners station, basically telling me, turn left, stop turn, turn right, stop turn, climb. And between Tarmia and Taji, there was a set of high tension wires that were probably about 250 feet high. And we're saying, Eric, don't let me hit those wires because I can't see them. We were flying back and, you know, I was kind of controlling, you know, telling him, hey, you need to climb. We had big high tension wires were ahead of us. And, and he, you know, climbed. If, you know, if I was out, we'd have, we'd have hit those wires. And so he, he got us out. We negotiated the wires. Things sort of calmed down a little bit. And I told Brian, hey, I think we're going to get this under control. I think we can make it back. Same time, I'm trying to get Eric, how bad are you hurt? Eric, how bad are you hurt? Captain Hudson's back there, you know, are you all right? You all right? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just, just get us back so we can, you know, land and not have to land out here in bad guy territory. You know, Camp Taji wasn't too far off. And about five minutes into our flight back, my legs started shaking real bad. And it's like, what the heck? I thought maybe it was was my nerves, you know, um, just like, okay, I'm starting to calm down. Now I'm like, whoa, that really just happened. And then they started burning. And that's when I was like, okay, something's not right. And I took my gloves, you know, they teach you to, you know, feel underneath, you know, check for blood. And that's when, I, you know, I went underneath my leg and came out and my gloves had blood on them. As we're on short and final, that's when I told him, I was like, you know, hey, call fire and rescue, you know, I've been hit. I, I had no idea how bad at the time. And, um, you know, so he called in that. He landed that aircraft, was the most beautiful, perfect landing. There was no bump, no nothing. We touched down and he shut down everything. And in about 20 seconds of us landing, here comes Captain Hudson sliding down the EFAB, you know, flying my door open. You okay? You okay? You know, checking on me. I'm, How the heck did he get out of there so quick and, and get up here, you know? And, and But that was just, you know, that's how close our teams were. They, we didn't care about ourselves. We cared about our wingman. We cared about the person we were flying with. 
then fire and rescue came up and I just unbuckled and rolled out the side and they just pulled me out. I was headed over to the uh, extension and uh, I don't know, last 20, 30 feet, something like that, started working the pedals and there was nothing there. I was turning as I used power. So I just nosed it over, got on the ground, got it and tucked up right behind their aircraft and gave the controls to Lieutenant Haas, like, shut her down. I'm going up there to check on Eric. I started shutting down the aircraft from the back seat. I did not follow the checklist. I just turned the engines off, <laughs> made sure the rotor stopped turning. I knew Eric was hit, uh, but I didn't know how bad. I remember her running up to the uh, group of people that were around around Eric who they pulled out of the aircraft already. And I remember seeing a, a large red pool on the, on the tarmac. And I stopped, I was like, Eric's dead. Like, there's no way you can lose that much blood. And uh, as I got closer, I remember hearing Eric laugh. <laughs> and I'm like, I get up there and they, they had laid him next down and it was all hydraulic fluid from the aircraft from jettisoning the wing stars. And Eric was laughing, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like Eric, you asshole. <laughs> uh, obviously Eric survived, but uh, I remember uh, after that, I was just walking around the aircraft and looking at all the, all the holes we were focused on on Mike and, and Eric's aircraft, obviously, because they had taken a um, significant amount of damage. And uh, I remember the PC officer saying, hey, sir, is that your aircraft back there? And I was like, yeah, I was, I was flying the trail. And he's like, you look at the tail yet? Like, no. He's like, hey, come back here with me. And we walked back, and we looked at the tail or gearbox, and there was the oil slick coming out of it, and it looked like glitter glue. Once they took it apart, there was a 12-7 round or part of a 12-7 round that was stuck inside the tail rotor, about the size of the end of your pinky. And it was just, and they were grinding the gears apart. Uh, I remember Kevin Smith saying, he's like, you, you probably had about 10 more minutes left, you know? We had just come on shift. I was running the radios. Me and Matt Skyver's aircraft was lead, and Troy and Micah's aircraft was trail. We got the call over the radio that the uh, Tarmia base was under attack, and we possibly had a fallen angel. So, you know, what we did, we, you know, put it in and, and uh, got there as fast as we could. It probably took 10 minutes to get up there. Laura Peranek was the battle captain that day, and she came on the radio and said, uh, she's talking to us at this point, telling us, look, here's, here's the situation. You know, there's intense small arms fire. They have RPGs and uh, uh, heavy machine gun fire. Um, and as she's telling me all this, I'm like, why are we going there then? This is crazy. <laughs> but uh, again, I was with Matt, and anytime I was flying with him, I felt comfortable. But uh, I remember I asked him, I was like, hey, uh, Matt, are you a little bit nervous at all? And I was trying to say it in a controlled way. And he goes, hell yeah, man. And uh, him saying that calmed me down uh, and, and helped me focus on the, on the fight. Uh, and we got there, I'm talking to Blue Four, which was certain first class housing. At this point, they're on the roof trying to maintain their ground. So I, I checked in with the air weapons team and said, hey, just continue to, uh, to, to, keep, to keep them outside of our perimeter. Please, please keep them in a bubble uh, 300 meters away. The volume of fire that was, that was directed at those guys, I swear I, I could see the rounds and it was really uh, intimidating. We did two initial passes, talking to Sergeant Housie, trying to kind of develop the situation with them so that we could engage and be effective as opposed to just uh, scaring them with the, the presence, which works sometimes, but it was not working that day. We flew over this little three-story house and it had a little room with a door on top of a roof. And there were two guys in there that kept shooting at us. And uh, we made our, a third pass over the top of them and the aircraft jumped, you know, 10, 15 feet up into the air. And uh, it was really funny. And, and looking back on it, I, I laugh about it. Every time I think about it, I said, holy crap, Matt, what was that? And he goes, well, that was an RPG, sir. <laughs> and it was real calm. We did a couple more passes, finally kind of figured out where they needed us to, to shoot at. And as they're, they're finally telling me that, I look out the left window and Micah's already raking it with 30 mic. 
and just destroyed that same building that we got shot at from. And at that same time, uh, Troy and Micah got hit. The old mistake of, you know, never ever fly the enemy. Well, at that point in time, I had an idea where they were patrolling at and uh, made that mistake of going right where they were, kind of like a moth to a flame, and getting low and slow and trying to figure out what was going on. I remember Troy, I was in the front seat and heard something hit the aircraft and some kind of sounds like gravel. Started hearing the uh, ting, 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 you know, and it's uh, not something that's very comforting. I was like, hey, uh, I think we're getting shot. All right, we might be taking fire. And so at that point, we dipped the nose forward and continued on and got out of there. I tried to you know, do a battle damage assessment, and that's when we had got a, a caution uh, aural tone and, and uh, light associated with a utility hydraulics level low at that time. We flew out to the southeast to get away from the fight so we could survey his aircraft and make sure it was okay. We got up next to him. Uh, Matt uh, was an MTP. He looked at it and said, you know, what are your indications? They told him. They had shot through one of our utility hydraulic lines and Boeing builds a pretty good airframe so it, it's redundant and it basically shut off the hydraulics for the utility side but we still have primary side so we we were able to stay in the fight they had bullet holes in their aircraft and there was fluid coming out and we're still willing to to get back in the fight I just remember thinking man these guys are the real deal um, and how cool it is to be associated with a group of guys that's willing to do that because at this point, for Demon Troop, it was life or death. We had a striker company attached to us. Their call sign was Avalanche. Avalanche calls me and says, hey, we're en route to evacuate your casualties. I said, good, because we have guys who are not going to make it. These dudes are starting to bleed out. Our aircraft got hit a couple times as well. Not near as bad as Mike and Troy's. It kind of got to the point where I think it was uh, Matt saying, hey, we need to get these aircraft back and get, get two more aircraft. A crew did finally come and replace us. We always do a battle handover, especially that type of a scenario when someone's in the fight. So we landed, both of us got out of the aircraft, hopped into the spares, and flew back out. We were gone maybe 30 minutes and then back into the fight, and the situation hadn't changed much. Uh, they were still taking a lot of lead from those guys. And they had organized themselves enough that they were ready to start doing some medevacs. The Apaches were providing air cover, and then Avalanche showed up. They just backed their strikers up to the giant hole in our wall. All of uh, eight litter teams, including myself, everyone was an eight litter team that day. We loaded up the five most wounded guys, and then the Apaches then provided security over the HLZ. The strikers then moved out uh, the whole time. They were taking contact. They established a perimeter around the HLZ. I was talking on the radio to the medevac guys that were coming in, and the guy called in and said, uh, hey, is that LZ uh, cherry or ice? And uh, I said, uh, sir, it's about as cherry as it's ever going to get. And his response was, and you could just hear the defeat in his voice, roger that. But they still came in. When they landed, I watched an RPG go over the nose of their cabin, and they held it rock solid while they were loading those guys up. I know that uh, Blackhawk guys don't hear it a lot from Apache dudes, but that was the bravest thing I've ever seen in my life. The medevacs birds landed and we were able to get the five most wounded guys out. Staff Sergeant Cologne, unfortunately, was killed immediately during the blast, um, instantly. Uh, and then uh, PFC McCarn didn't make it. So in the course of four days, we lost three soldiers. They did maybe five or six turns with the Blackhawks to pick up wounded from Tarmia. And we basically provided cover for them while they were there on the ground, gloating up. And when they left, we would stay in provide security for the cop itself because it was, there were still bad guys all over the place. When we got out there, you know, everything was just still smoking and it looked like just a post-apocalyptic rubble. The crater where the V-bed went off was the biggest crater I'd seen in all of my diplomas combined in my military career. There was no window left anywhere in the place. You wonder how anybody, just, you know, survived or walked away from that. It, just, it was just catastrophic. We were still getting small arms fires. We came into the compound. Guys were still firing on the roof. So I took a squad of guys up there, you know, kind of try to provide some relief. And these dudes, I don't, I don't see how they could see. There was so much debris and blood and sweat and just everything. 
half of them were, you know, fixing to go black on ammo. You know, there was just empty magazines everywhere, shell casings. The wall in front of them, where some of these guys were shooting from, it was crumbling around us. I don't see how the building survived it, honestly. So the strikers establish a 100-meter perimeter around the patrol base and start pushing the, uh, the enemy further out. At the same time, one of my really good friends, uh, Lieutenant Les Minges, he had a tank and a Bradley. They were securing Checkpoint 59 Alpha, so they just hauled ass the whole time. They were going about 50 miles an hour down and route coyotes. Um, Les shows up and goes, yeah. he's like, hey, I'm here. What do you need me to do? We're st still taking contact from this building uh, to the northeast. Les's tank begins to fire main gun rounds into this building. The striker fires an ATGM. And then I get a call from the roof saying, sir, you have to tell him to stop. This building's gonna collapse. The cracks in the building are expanding every time they fire. Please tell him to stop. So we stop firing toes, we stop firing main guns. And once Les's section showed up, it was pretty much done at that point. Because we had a platoon of strikers, we had an armor section. We had an AWT flying overhead. 100, 200 insurgents aren't gonna do anything. So things had calmed down at that point. So I go up to the roof and everyone's got bandages, everyone's cut, everyone's bleeding, everyone's in their underwear, brown t-shirts. A couple dudes running around in shower shoes. A couple dudes are running around and their feet are bleeding because they didn't, couldn't find their shoes. They just, they were fighting on like broken glass. Um, and I remember talking to one of the guys from Blue Platoon, Staff Sergeant Oscar Ayala, and he goes, hey, he said, this is something out of a movie, isn't it? And I was like, yeah, it really is. Like, you don't ever think, like, something this crazy would happen to you. And he's like, no, it, it just did, though. And it's over. There was three things that saved everyone's life that day. First being Lieutenant Jokinen shooting the driver. Second being Specialist Vang and getting the comms up. And then the last thing is the air weapon teams showing up. It was absolutely apparent that there were so many enemy out there that we could not hold them off forever. But the Apache showed up and it was just, they, they were just flying over a storm of tracers, just engaging everyone with 30 millimeter. Um, every time they were start getting close to the patrol base or occupy a rooftop, they, they, would do, uh, they would do a gun run, eliminate the threat. And had that not been there, I don't, I don't know if any of us would be standing here today. Um, it could very well be, you know, the, the headline in the New York Times could have read like 36 soldiers die in Iraq. The big horse patch. I'll tell you, everybody's in the worst unit ever until they leave it, right? I didn't feel that way about First Cav. I knew we brought something to the table. Um, that that swagger that you bring with a bunch of obnoxious gun pilots wearing Stetsons. I can't think of a time when we were out on the hunt over the top of our ground brothers where they had to deal with more than they could handle. We took a lot of pride in that and um, still wear the, the patch proudly. So. Well, the 1st Air Cavalry Brigade is legendary from its history all the way back to the beginnings in Vietnam. And that's why I spent so much time in the Air Cav. It's just the mentality 
uh, were there for the troops on the ground. You know, that was borne out in Vietnam with the way the air mobile operations affected ground operations, both in the movement of passengers and also the support of them with the gunships. All the way through the development of the Cobras and now into the Apaches, that mentality of protecting the troops on the ground has not wavered through the course of the air cavalry history. I remember Jimbo Snyder saying, you should fear the man with the big patch because when the man with the big patch shows up, we start kicking ass right before we left. And I, I like, that's what we're going to do. That, that, and that meant a lot. Like looking back on it, like, okay, yeah, that, that was kind of, that was kind of cliche, but it, it, it meant something here, hearing those things. Like those, it's kind of like playing in a, in a big football game or baseball game and you, you get the motivational speech from the coach and you're, and, it, and if he just stopped you on the street and said, it wouldn't mean anything, but but saying it right before the first quarter, right before kickoff, you're like, let's go out there and make some stuff happen. Being assigned to a famous division like that, it's an honor and it's also, you know, you have a responsibility to uphold the tradition of that unit. You know, if you're serious about being a soldier, that's a unit that people are trying to be in because of the history that it has. And I think you know, we upheld that tradition and we upheld that history and it added a page to that history. There's not too many people that can say they were in the first cab, you know, and wear that Stetson and wear the spurs and everything. And that's, that's something. Being in the cab, you wear Stetson. I'm wearing it right now. You kind of, it's kind of more camaraderie and a family organization than some of the other units I've been in. Being in the first cab in itself, there's a lot of history that never ends. There's still a horse detachment at big ceremonies, the cavalry charge. There's a lot of historical things that are still being done today, even in you know the 21st century. Best unit I ever served with. Um, my father was in first cab in Vietnam, so I thought it was kind of cool that you know we got to wear the same patch, uh, different points in history, um, but no less significant points in history. I'd always wanted to be in First Cav. It was really a privilege to be part of that division. Out of my 24 and a half year career, I spent almost 13 years in First Cav in one ACB, one two two seven, and I uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. It's um, it's you know if I have a home, that's that's where it is. And that's why I still live around Fort Hood. For me, you know, I was blessed to be able to fly the Huey, the Cobra, and then get into the Apache. So you kind of have some hands on with that that uh, those legacy aircraft. Um, but to just be, you know, part of First Cav, uh, you know, proud of this day to, to wear the big patch and, you know, the funny hat. And, uh, yeah, I just, First Cav. I came to First Cav because they offered the largest reenlistment bonus at the time, and I wanted to get back to Texas, not even going to lie. Uh, you know, I've been away from home about three years and, you know, wanted to come back to Texas. And a lot of people are like, what were you thinking? And it, it was the best mistake I ever made. Uh, loved the first cab, did three deployments in a row. Uh, I'll be a cavalryman slash infantryman for the rest of my life. Uh, still have my Stetson, you know. I like to think after my time in Solder City and OF to, to my time in the Sunni Triangle during the surge, and then when I went to Saddam's hometown to crit my third deployment, that, you know, when people see the first cab patch, they think, you know, that's not just a gentle horse, that's a horse of death. Don't mess with those guys. On the 31st of May, we, uh, we were doing a left seat, right seat ride. It was a mission uh, for some uh, another unit that had come in and they were stationed in, in Biop and we were supposed to uh, take off from Taji go down to buy off and pick them up and then continue south of Baghdad to continue to hand over part of our uh, area of operations to, uh, to another unit. I was getting toward the end of my command. I knew I was gonna change out in June or July. And whenever you change out as a commander, there's a certain amount of evaluations that you have to turn in. And my philosophy has always been, hey, I'm not gonna let those ride. So I had to take an administrative day to really do reports on guys. So I got Steve Kilgore to take my seat that day. I thought it'd be probably a pretty good mission for me to, to bow out on. It was a crap mission. It was, you know, we were already unhappy about uh, third ID coming in and kind of taking over some of our battle space in the surge. Uh, 
because they were taking the Salmon Pock area away from us, to be the guys out there showing them around, uh, doing their left seat, right seat, and their local orientation was not going to be fun anyway. Um, so when we went in that day, we were already kind of discouraged about what we were doing. Just like every other day, you get an S3 brief, like, hey, this is your mission, this is what you're gonna do, these are the people you're gonna talk to, and that was pretty short. Then we got the S2 brief, and they, they laid some stuff out, and it, they go, and we got a report that there's a guy building gun trucks at this grid. Like, oh, well, we can make that on our way, we'll check that out. We would occasionally say to the pilots, you know, don't go over to this AO unless you're looking to, well, we forgot that we were talking to attack pilots, and you know they're fully equipped to deal with whatever's coming at them so uh, this is one of those instances but the intel we got was really really credible we told them the same thing hey just heads up sergeant twist briefs it to some crews knowing that you know these crews are going to want to avoid this area they're not going to go on, want to go out there because obviously if, if they're setting up an air ambush uh, you would think a, a aircraft would not want to go out there. But uh, then he gave it to this other crew, uh, and they decided that they were going to go hunting. We had lost a lot of aircraft uh, out to the west, obviously. But by this point, we have well known that, uh, that it, they had kind of free range out there to, to drive around. So we decided we were going to go out there and see if we could find the trucks on our way down to buy out, just kind of swing out, and then turn south and head down to Baghdad. We took off that day, uh, so I had Cole Mohan in the front seat who by then was pretty seasoned as a junior guy and had been in a lot of engagements. My wingman was Steve Kilgore and Lieutenant Brian Haas at the time. We pulled out there and, and looked around, didn't find anything, nothing in the palm groves. Said, okay, well, let's go on down to Baghdad and pick up the Kiowa Warrior guys and go show them around. As we lined out to head toward Baghdad International Airport, this truck comes driving up the road and this guy just drives into the road ditch in this Bongo truck jumps out of his truck and goes low crawling out in the field. I did just jump out and uh, lay down in the ditch on your bongo out your right door. Yeah, he's low crawling. Yeah, there's something going on out here. There's somebody doing something bad. Keep your eyes sharp. I've seen some strange stuff over here, but that's just beyond the baseline of weird. Um, and then a car comes up the road, does the same thing. Like a family jumps out of this car and just low crawls out in this field. Wow, these people uh, know the drill. I remember Bill saying, man, these people are scared. They, they must not see Apache as much. And uh, he, he called called Steve Kilgore and Brian Haas, who were in gun two, said, hey, I'm gonna go by low and slow, give them a wave, let them know that we're not here to hurt them. And, uh, so, and Steve goes, yeah, I'll take up outer security. And he, he, he popped up and picked up a slow left orbit. I'm gonna go by and wave at them and tell them they're okay, basically, so they can calm down. And so we came down low. I think we got, I think we got down like 30 feet and 20 knots. We got real low, real slow. As we're coming by to wave at these people, I hear Steve, and I could hear the stress in his voice, and it instantly made made my the hair on the back of my neck stand up, a spidey sense tingle. Yeah, that guy's got a gun. He's got a gun. He's got a big gun. He's got a big gun. Big gun out the right. Big gun out the right. He's the mic. Goes out my rear. Out my rear. And I look over there. And I started stuttering because I wanted to say, hey, I, I see it. I could see, the, see this muzzle flash. And I just, I just kept, uh, 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 uh. I, I couldn't say what I, was, I wanted to say because of the stress of it all. I remember seeing a guy uh, next to a, a bongo truck with an AK-47. And I remember telling Steve, like, hey, he's got a gun. Uh, what I didn't see right away was a guy that was in the back of the bongo truck with a 12-7. And looking back at the tape, he was about 200 meters outside of our right-hand door. And then at that point, I let Steve know that I saw a big gun. <laughs> uh, you know, I just, I, I'm like, big gun, big gun, out the right side. And Steve tried to pause the gun and suppress, but it was way outside of the limits of where, you know, where our gun could get to. Uh, so he just, you know, down to the down to the deck as low as we could go and straight out, get away from him so we come back in and suppress. We saw him and, and rolled out, uh, headed toward him. Uh, and I could see the muzzle flash from the gun, so I, you know, was the 30 millimeter and fired a couple bursts of 30 down there uh, to to break the ambush. I'm engaging over there. I'm coming around to pick up your. We are right now about 2K. One of the big things we learned from Keith and Jason's shoot down is assess the situation. So we we broke off, headed to the west a little bit, 
and I immediately formed up on Steve's aircraft and looked at his aircraft. We gave him a, a quick once over. They weren't leaking any fuel, they weren't leaking hydraulic fluid, there weren't any big holes in the helicopter, no smoke. Check our systems, check our pressures and everything. System cage all looks good. I said, okay, you guys look fine. Let's get back in the fight. So we turned back inbound. As we turned inbound, the, the vehicle that I had suppressed, um, it had wounded a couple of the guys. I don't know if we got any of them or not, but it definitely had had damaged the vehicle. It was driving toward a house. So we were kind of focused on that. We roll in and Bill's like, get a missile off. So I was the missile and he fires a rocket. Fire. Hit it. No, you got backscatter. And I can't, and the missiles got backscatter. It, it just can't track the laser. I'm like, it's backscatter. I'm just sitting there, backscatter, backscatter. And Bill's like, all right, gun. So I, I was the gun. I start shooting gun at it. All right, going gun. Gun, get him. Hit it again. We pull off to the left, and I look out the right, and I see another flash, and it's like, it feels like it's in my face, like, like it's a strobe light right in my face. And I got, I got, I got another gun shooting, and. I got, I got a little bit dyslexic at the time. I said, it's out the, shooting out the left, and I'm, I'm looking hard right. Got another gun shooting out the left. Taking fire. Where? Out the right? Or out the right, the right, the right. We wheeled around and got on the three trucks racing down the road. They clearly were out of ambush mode in escape mode at that point. They were going as fast as you can go in a bongo truck down a dirt road. Uh, but the guy in the back of the trail bongo was still doing everything he could to shoot us down. He's shooting at him. Kill it. Kill it. Go the way. Good missile. Stay on it, buddy. Missed. I try to get a missile off, and and it, it misses long, because I'm, I'm all over the place. Like, the fine motor control is out of the, out of the question at this point because of all the adrenaline I'm feeling. Uh, I remember getting out of the aircraft afterwards, and my hands just shaking. So we come back around. We fire another missile at him. Stay on him. Gun, go gun. Roger. Engaging. I'm going after the guys. That was the most scared I've ever been in my life, was during that whole process. And being able to overcome that and, and just function was, was a credit to training. When we rolled in on that second group, that group of three, as we're flying down, that guy's just steadily shooting at me. I can see it in the TAS, and I go, he's shooting at us. He's shooting at us. I'm trying to get this missile to track, to, to get, because the missile was giving me a not ready message. I even said, like, Bill, Bill said something like, we'll shoot him. He's like, missile's not ready. He goes, he said, hurry the fuck up. I'm like, no, okay, hurry up. Like, I, I didn't, but looking back on it, there, I, that, that part, that's funny, but it, that the stress was, was, it, was there. So we, we, we handed off with the colonel's team and flew back. We got back to Taji and we, we were convinced Steve's helicopter had bullet holes in it. So we shut down in the FARP. Uh, I hopped out, ran over and helped Steve look at his aircraft. Not a mark on him. Yeah, the thing was good. I said, well, maybe I had to look at mine. So we walked over and as we're walking over, I can see, you know, uh, composites sticking up out of the top of a rotor blade. Then there's a 14.5 hole straight through the straight through the bottom of one of the blades. Luckily, that was it. That was the only damage to the helicopter. I was walking onto the flight line. Lo and behold, this aircraft stops next to me. And of course, you're carrying all your stuff like, man, really, what are you doing? Come on. And it's Bill. And Bill's like, what? And he's yelling at me, last, last. And so I run up to the aircraft and I see it's Bill. I'm like, what? He goes, and he takes a sheet of paper and he writes down this grid and writes down, you know, what you, it basically gives me a battle handover on this piece of paper. And I'm like, he goes, go back out there. There's still more and they're, they're reinforcing and they're trying to take the guns and take the bad guys. Go, go, go pick them off. I'm like, okay. So I run, I run to the aircraft, I jump in and I call the talk and I tell them what happened. And, and, uh, they said, yeah, stand down. I'm like, what? I'm like, there's bad guys out there, man. But yeah, it's not our battle space. I'm like, and I plotted it. And it was like right at, the, right at the corner of our battle space and the Marine Corps battle space. And I said, but if there's no one out there and there's no one on the ground, I mean, let's go get them. 
and yeah. We're going back out, we're gonna finish this up. So we get back, we jump one aircraft, and it breaks. So we hop out, we go to the next one, and that one breaks. So we go to a, to a third, and that one, the APU doesn't start. So we go back to the first one that we jumped to, like it's fixed now, we hop in it, and something else breaks on it. And I said, I go, Bill, I don't, I don't know where you stand on these things, but, but I'm a man of faith, and I feel like somebody's telling us that it's just not our time to go back out there. And to Bill's credit, he calls Steve, he's like, hey, I, I think we should probably call it. I think that we've had enough. The other team's out there working it. There's another team going out there that, that's gonna finish it up, and, and, and I, th I think we're probably done. I'm just exhausted, so I kinda, kinda sat there on the pavement for a minute, and then we got up and collected all of our stuff, went to go debrief, and decided, hey, we're gonna go to Midnight Chow, because we, we, last meal we'd ate, I think, was lunch. And so I went, and I didn't get anything but two bowls of ice cream. And I sat down across from Steve Kilgore, and he goes, he goes you keep eating like that, you're going to get fat. And I was like, Steve, I don't care. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I'm going to enjoy today, right now. And that's all I ate for dinner that night. It's like just these two heaping bowls of ice cream. We kind of seen a more um, offensive nature, I believe, after the incidents of February, um, because it, it was evident that there was an insurgency, and it was uh, moneyed, equipped, uh, well-motivated um, type of force that we were that we were up against. It was not your typical one or two ZID in place or typical sniper. I mean, it was it was becoming a lot more sophisticated and a lot more organized um, the way the enemy operated. Um, so, uh, definitely after the the events of, of February, we. Now, I'm not saying we were asleep before, because we, we definitely are not. We were um, racking up engagements th throughout that rotation. Uh, but it seemed to be late summer, spring of that year became the turning point. There was some, thing, some people that called into question what they were doing out there, but they're absolutely executing what my intent was for the guys. Hey, we, you know, Intel drives maneuver. They got an intelligence report that, hey, there's you know, 10 or 12 gun trucks in a palm grove out west of Taji. So they just adjusted their route on the way down to do their mission to go check it out. There's no doubt in my mind, no shadow of a doubt that those were the, the people that were responsible for shooting down a number of aircraft during that rotation. So those were, were good kills. And really beyond, after that engagement, um, really not a whole lot happened out there until I think September of, of that year right at the one year mark, but that was a kind of a one-off, I think. What is effective is not necessarily by the book. You know, the, I think if you look through history, I believe there was a German general said the, you know, the American army is very difficult to fight because we don't follow our own doctrine. So the US military's uh, famous for not doing what it's supposed to do. You know, that allows its leaders to think and get outside the box and do innovative things. And, uh, you know, when it works, it's great. And when it doesn't, I, you know, people pay the price. So, uh, you know, it's how much risk you're willing to take. And it, it paid off that day. So I don't think you can, you can argue against it too much because it worked. Honestly, when I think about that deployment, um, I think of pre-Yoakum and Dufresne and, and post-Yoakum Dufresne. 
and how everybody rallied around Yoakum when he was here, and then they rallied, we rallied around Yoakum into friends' memory after that, and it changed us all. It was definitely the longest 15 months. Um, so many people did amazing things outside the month of February. Uh, Micah Johnson, uh, Laura Peranek, Jeff Friedrich, Micah Johnson again, uh, you know, Troy Mosley, Clint Burleson, Tommy Liu, Bill Hamm. It didn't slow down after February. Um, There's still amazing stories to be told. You can't describe what it's like when you hear a kid on the other end of the radio and he's out of breath and he's panicked and he's scared. He has no idea what's going on. He's getting shot at. Um, and you come in, you know, here comes the Cav um, to save the day. When that kid on the ground is, is at his wits end and you come in and you try to talk him down off the ledge, so to speak, and you calm him down, it's like, hey, take a breath. Tell me where they're at. What do they got? What do you want me to do? And it's almost like the switch goes off in his head. He's like, oh, I've been trained to do this. Um, you know, I've got guys with AKs and RPGs at this grid. Positive ID, cleared hot. Okay, here we go. You know, this is what you're trained to do. Um, and then ultimately getting those kids home, you know, every, every night back to the FOB. That's, that's what it's about. I don't necessarily think it's one of those situations where anything really stays with you more than you leave something over there that makes any sense. Uh, that 16 months took a lot. Mm. I'd do it all over again, but yeah, you're never the same. A lot of those kids are in Tarmia that day. They're not the same. And they never will be. What we saw and what we did on that tour shaped my attitude as a senior warrant officer, shaped the way that I coached new pilots coming up when when I became senior, when I became an SP, when I started working at battalion level on, on future combat tours. Um, without my experiences in the surge and the mentorship that I received in first attack, uh, I don't think I'd have been successful. I think it, uh, I think my time in first attack it shaped me forever. I'm not a big fan of, or nor do I refer to all the decorations that, you know, or accolades that are, are given, but um, I'll tell you a lot of air medals and a lot of distinguished flying crosses were awarded that rotation. Those aren't important. What's important is the emails of gratitude that you get from people who, who you bailed out of a bad situation and uh, the stories that, you know, um, are evoked by someone just mentioning that you were you were a crazy horse downrange. When I went on R and R, um, you know, you're just lumped in with everybody that's going home. So this E four comes up to me, he's like, "Hey, you're Apache pilot. Wh which what's your call sign?" I'm like, we're, I'm, "I'm a crazy horse." Well, I was in Tarmia when you guys you guys saved our lives, and he was very appreciative of what what we had done, and it felt like we we'd done a good job. And that made me feel better. That, that made me feel good about what we were doing. And like, now that I felt bad. I didn't, like, they, they were, but that made me feel like the job I was doing was important and needed. There's babies that are here now, you know, from, from our actions of saving guys' lives. You know, there's, there's grandbabies out there. There's weddings. There's, you know, new relationships because, you know, you say a lot of those guys are young. They're, you know, 18 years old, and that was, what, 12 years ago now? So they're, they've got kids of their own. They've got families of their own, and, and you see them on Facebook, and you see them, their, their kids grow up, and, and you, you just, it just gives you goosebumps, you know? You're like, I helped, you know, start a family, you know, because you, you were there. You did your job, you know, you did your mission. Like my dad told me when I was a kid, because we're, I hate to keep using the Audie Murphy example, uh, but when I was a kid, that movie came on every year on the local station in Waco. And uh, I remember sitting there, I was like 10, 11, or 12 years old, and my dad was a World War II vet. So I said, you know, at the end of that movie, they're pinning, you know, they're hanging the Medal of Honor around 
Audie Murphy's neck. And I go, wow, that's that's really something, Dad. You know, he got the Medal of Honor. And my dad goes, uh, you know, for every one like Audie Murphy, there's like 10 that you'll never hear of. And uh, being 10, 10 years old, I go, yeah, Dad, whatever. You know, because, you know, I'm 10. I know better than Dad. So 30 years later, I'm in combat. And I've come to find out that, of course, Dad's right, you know. He's no longer, you know, around. <clears throat> but, yeah, he, <clears throat> he's right. 